Well, good evening. I hope that you are thoroughly enjoying your evening so far. It is not normal. We normally have, I'm not sure how many people packed in here all beside each other, but we've done our best to bring as many people to you virtually and on screen as possible and to those watching at home as well. Wasn't the choir piece incredible to be able to have them in some shape or form? Miss them so much. Um, and also the kids' choir as well. I think that one is the pick of the night without doubt. Uh, I think our music is in safe hands, given the singers and the instrumentalists and pianists and all the different things. Not to say leave Susanna Gardner as a performer out at the end. She even has the hair flick and everything, doesn't she? She's incredible. So it's amazing to have all of that. And I just want to convey my gratitude to the team who you see on the camera, but also all of the different people that you don't see behind the camera doing all the editing of videos and all the editing of sound and all of that to make that possible. We really do appreciate uh, just all the service that goes into making things like tonight happen. So I'm up here for the next 20 minutes or so, and I'm going to continue a series that we started last week, A Light Has Dawned, looking at this section of Isaiah. And Stephen Cave started that last week. I'm going to complete that. If you didn't hear last week, don't panic. You'll still be able to follow along and make sense. And I'm going to read from verse 19 of chapter 8 of the book of Isaiah up to verse 7 of chapter 9, and you can follow along with me. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upwards will curse their king and their God. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. A wonderful reading, and we're just going to spend a little bit of time unpacking a little bit of that. Now, there's no doubt you've heard it said, and you've probably said it yourself, that this Christmas is not going to be like any other Christmas. And I know that for a lot of us, that means a lot of difficult and challenging circumstances. And I don't in any way mean to minimize any of those, but I hope you'll permit me to start off on a slightly lighter note than that, with a key difference about this Christmas. That, is, that has probably flown under the radar, if we're being honest, but an important one all the same, definitely for me, and that is this. This is the first Christmas since 1972 that there will be no Argos catalogue. 
Now, for some of you of a certain age, that might not mean a great deal, but the people of my vintage, child who grew up in the 80s, we don't understand Christmas without our gas catalogs. Not to be able to open up this book of light in November and pour over all the possibilities that there might be looking through every single part of the toy section, thinking about all those 80s toys that might change your life. It's impossible to think of Christmas without that. And I was looking through, you can actually get every Argos catalog online, believe it or not. You can look back all the way back to the 70s or whatever. And I was looking back through and I found a few of those toys that, that I really, really wanted. My brother and sister are here tonight, so they'll remember. Subutio was a big thing. And I think my brother actually got that one Christmas, but you can take your FIFA and have your FIFA. Sabudio wins every time. Or on the right-hand side, this is one I never got. The, I think it was called the Turnin' Turbo Dashboard. It was the first little car racing game you could get. I don't know whether anybody remembers that. And then a little later, and I did get this, a MIDI system. Not just with a turntable. Not just with a, an FM AM radio. Oh, no. It also had a double tape deck with high-speed dubbing. <laughs> You're laughing, but that was incredible. And I got that at about age 11 or 12 to set off my 80s room, which was colored gray, black, and red, just in case you're wondering, a perfect 80s room. But another toy that you were able to get in the 80s, not one that I owned myself, not one that I ever wanted, was this one. I wonder who owned this toy. The Hasbro Glowworm. Put up your hand if you ever owned a Glowworm. Oh, there's a few. Not as many in this service, but there are a few. And this little Glowworm, this um, sat in the bedroom, and as you squeezed it at night, it lit up and acted as a little nightlight, hence the little nightcap and the pajamas. Now, let me show you a picture of a real Glowworm. Not quite as cute. No nightcap, no pajamas. It's a beetle, actually. It's not a worm at all. And this is the female which to attract the attention of her male counterpart creates this thing called bioluminescence. In other words, she produces light from inside herself to create this chemical reaction. And when you get lots of glowworms together, you can get pictures like this. This is in a cave in New Zealand. Now, what am I talking about glowworms for? Or bioluminescence? Well, you could say I think that the philosophy of the Western culture in which we live is moving more and more towards this kind of philosophy of bioluminescence. In other words, to the question, where is it that we should look for light? The answer very commonly that we get is inside ourselves. When it comes to my identity, for example, where do I find the light that illuminates who I truly am? And the answer that we're given is from inside yourself, from inside your mind, from how you feel, from in here, not from any external source. And the same for questions of flourishing or fulfillment or purpose. The only light there is, we're told, is the light of the inner truth within you. And to be fulfilled, to flourish, to have purpose, you need to follow the guidance of your own bioluminescence. It's the light of your inner self that's sovereign. Now, I don't know about you, but as I reflect on my own life, on my own inner self, I know that if I was to live according to that kind of philosophy, if that was to be the sole source of my sense of identity or worth or decision-making or life choices, I truly shudder to think where I might be. Because whatever light there is in my wisest of days, in my strongest of days, in my best of days, it doesn't come close to being enough to guide me through and out of darkness. And more broadly, if this year has brought anything home to us, it's this, even with all of our combined light, the light of the top political minds and economic minds and scientific and medical, that combined light, it's not enough. We're still scrabbling around in the dark. And this year, 
to some extent, we are a people walking in great darkness, and the depth of the darkness that we have been experiencing has perhaps given us a new stark realization of the desperately low wattage of our own light. And that's the picture that Isaiah paints here at the end of chapter 8. People looking to themselves or their so-called experts or scholars or mystics and saying, we can overcome this darkness with the light that we have in ourselves. And as a result, thrusting themselves further and deeper into that darkness. Now, the Christmas we're used to is surrounded by sentimentality. But Isaiah's message here and the wider message of Scripture at Christmas is not sentimental in the slightest. It tells things how they really are. There is deep darkness, Isaiah says here. And when we try to deal with the darkness by the strength of our own light, whether that's the darkness inside of ourselves or whether that's the darkness of the world that we live in, we just end up in greater darkness. That's what he says. But then he goes on. He doesn't leave it there. Hope is stirred with the first word in chapter 9. Nevertheless. There is a nevertheless. There is an answer to the darkness. There is a light that is dawned, and that light is a child born, a son given. And Stephen did a great job of explaining the immediate context of Isaiah's prophecy last week of Judah under the rule of Ahaz, a king who chose to put his trust in his own intellect and his own military savvy, who chose to follow his own light and put his hope in Assyria as Judah's savior rather than through God, trusting in God who told him to wait and do nothing. And Ahaz's savior would turn out disastrously. Savior would turn to oppressor, and Assyria would be the first in a long line of oppressors of Judah. Babylon would follow, and Persia would follow, and Greece, and then Rome. And Isaiah's prophecy of a great light dawning in the form of a child spans these centuries of oppression and darkness. And this hope of a light to come as he writes this prophecy down is so sure for Isaiah that he talks about the future in the past tense. It's so beyond doubt that he talks about it as if it's already happened. Here's God's answer to the darkness. Not a light will dawn, but a light has dawned. That's the certainty of the promise that will be fulfilled centuries later in David's town of Bethlehem. A son named Jesus, or the Hebrew Yeshua, Yahweh saves, because God does not leave us in our darkness. And as we look at what Isaiah says and see the significance of it, he talks about gloom in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. These were the lands in the north of Israel that were the first to experience the oppression of Assyria in the north. It's here where darkness began that the great light first dawns. If we fast forward to Matthew 4 and of Jesus beginning his ministry in Capernaum, it tells us that he did that by the lake and area in Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. The first glimpse of the true light dawned in the very place that had first known such darkness and distress. And the first words of Jesus that Matthew records, after him arriving in Capernaum to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus proclaims his kingdom. This child, this son, is a king. A king who invades and dispels the darkness with light, who takes away sorrow and increases joy, who shatters the yoke of slavery across the backs of his people and brings them into freedom. And Isaiah explains that this child, this son, this king will be called four names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
And just for a few minutes, I want to look at those names and their significance. For those of us who have made Jesus our king, what do they mean for the present? What do they mean for our future? What do they mean for us, for the world? First, we see God's gift has given us a wonderful counselor. We don't have to rely on the light within ourselves to guide us. It's tragic to believe the lie that our light is enough to dispel the darkness. The truth is, without the guidance of the true light, we'll always be lost, always be confused, always be disorientated, and always be searching. And he is our wonderful counselor first because he was there at the very beginning. John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. That includes me, and it includes you. And that means he's wonderful because he created us, he designed us for a purpose. And so he, far more than we ever will with our own little light, is able to guide us to live according to our design, to live for our purpose. He has come, he tells us, so that we can have life and have it to the full, as it says in John 10.10. And not only that, he's wonderful counselor because he was born He entered humanity. He chose to step down into our darkness and go through the whole of human experience for us. Hebrews 4 talks about this. It says, For we do not have a high priest who's unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He knows. From the trivial things of every day that get on our nerves to the suffering that we face, all the way beyond that to unjust death. He knows. He's not guiding us in theory from a textbook, He's guiding us in empathy out of the wisdom of His own experience of being a human. He's our wonderful counselor who's given us both his word to teach us and his spirit to guide us and comfort us and counsel us in all truth. And he's wonderful counselor on our individual personal canvases. But he's also wonderful counselor on the canvas of his kingdom, of history, and where it's going. We can live lives filled with hope now, today, in this moment, because the wonderful counsel that we know and experience on a personal level is also the one who, in all wisdom, is working out his purposes and building his kingdom. And unlike an Ahaz, or a David, or a Solomon, or any other king or political leader, he's never made a wrong decision. He's never made a mistake. As Paul says in Romans 11, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He's a wonderful counselor. I've got a bit too excited about that. I won't spend as long on the others. He's also mighty God. The baby born into poverty and into the ignominy of a manger and stable in Bethlehem is God himself. Colossians 2 explains this incredible truth. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form all the fullness. Or Hebrews 1.3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. 
And I'm quoting Bible passages out of here because I don't have words of my own to get close to describing this. The light that has dawned is mighty God. He lacks nothing in power because he is God. There is no person he doesn't have the power to save, no sin that he doesn't have the power to forgive, no burden that he doesn't have the power to break, no brokenness that he doesn't have the power to heal and restore, no death that he doesn't have the power to raise to new life, no power of darkness that he doesn't have the power to overcome with his glorious light, his promises, his purposes, his will, his kingdom will not fail. The Son is mighty God. He's wonderful counselor. He's perfect in wisdom. He's mighty God. He is perfect in strength. And then he's everlasting father. He's perfect in love and care. He's not austere in his wisdom. He's not distant in his might. He's a king with a perfect father's heart who comes down, who draws near, He relates to us not as his subjects, but as his children. And by his spirit, we can know and experience this intimate fatherhood. Romans 8 tells us the spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies that we are God's children. He's everlasting Father, everlasting provider, everlasting protector, an everlasting giver of compassion and grace and love. Under his eternal care and protection, under the shadow of his wing, we do not need to fear even when we walk through the darkest of valleys. We are not on our own. And his kingdom and his fatherhood and then our sonship will last forever and ever. Nothing can snatch it away. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then finally, he's Prince of Peace. This King, this mighty God has not come to make war, but to make peace. To make perfect eternal peace between us and God. To deal with the sin that alienated us from God. To satisfy the wrath of God. Later, in another of Isaiah's prophecies of Christ, he prophesies the cross in these famous words, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Through Christ, the Prince of Peace, our irreversible status before God, our relationship with God, is one of perfect peace. And then through Christ, the Prince of Peace, we can experience an inner peace that transcends understanding. John, in John 14, Jesus tells his disciples, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. There's nothing empty or false about the peace that Jesus gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he said, and do not be afraid. And let's not make this something that it isn't. We do and we will experience distress and sorrow and pain, and anxiety, and panic. That doesn't make us weak Christians. Jesus, in the chapter before this, 
himself talked about being troubled in spirit, but what this does mean is that underneath all of this, because of the Prince of Peace, we can know a deep-seated peace and security and stability and light as His Spirit bears witness to our peace with God, as His Spirit bears witness to the fact that the world is not on our shoulders. It's on His shoulders. And because the world is on his shoulders, we can take a deep breath and relax ours. And then finally, we can have peace. We can have deep assurance because we know that his is a kingdom of peace and his kingdom is coming. We know the end of the story and knowing the end of the story makes all the difference for living in the present. And the end of the story is that he will reign in fullness of the greatness of his government and peace. Isaiah says there will be no end. And a couple of chapters later, we're given this beautiful imagery conveying the peace that will characterize his kingdom. And here's what it says. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy. On all my holy mountain, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. No enmity, no hostility, no fear at all, but reconciliation and restoration and transformation and peace. Shalom, peace. This is the kingdom promised under the kingship of the Son given, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, all of this is found in the person of Jesus. This is God's gift to those walking in darkness. This is God's gift to us. This is God's nevertheless for us. A child, a son, a king. The true light that gives light to all who acknowledge the darkness and turn to him and accept him and follow him as their light. Let's pray together. Father, this Christmas, as I said at the beginning, is going to be so different for all of us. And for many of us, it is going to be a time of sorrow and pain and loss. It's going to be a time of loneliness, confusion, weakness and weariness and turmoil. And we acknowledge this darkness. Perhaps we recognize it and understand it in a different way than we ever have before. And we say, Father, we need the light that has dawned. So for those of us tonight who are in confusion, who are disorientated in the darkness, Give us your counsel by your spirit. For those of us who are weak and weary, we turn to you for your strength. For those of us who are lonely and empty, we seek love and care under the shadow of your wing. And for those of us churned up, 
with turmoil in our hearts. We turn to you, our Prince of Peace. And we ask you to bring that peace that transcends understanding into our hearts. Thank you for the gift of your Son. It's in his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.